Hello, welcome to today's session. Oatly presents Tackling Coffee's Carbon Footprint. My name's Toby, I'm Barista Development Manager here at Oatly. I'm joined today by Tim Ridley, who is the founder of United Baristas. Over to you, Tim. Thanks very much. It's great to be here today. It can be all too easy to be overwhelmed by the scale and the complexity of climate change. So I thought it would be useful to provide an overview of where we're at, where we're going and how to get there. So let's start with the big picture. I love this image. I found it on the NASA website and I downloaded it and made it my screensaver because it fills me with a sense of awe. I find it astonishing that everything I know is on this green and blue sphere suspended in space. It's useful to pause for a minute and think that you could travel anywhere in the solar system and you wouldn't find life like you find on Earth. Also, as a coffee drinker, I always find it interesting to remind people that this is the only known coffee producer in the universe. If we zoom in, we can see the Earth's atmosphere. It's a protective blanket that is held in place by the Earth's gravitational field. The atmosphere is actually comprised mainly of eight different gases, and we're going to talk about two today. The first is oxygen because it's necessary for us to breathe. The good news is that there is more than enough oxygen to go around. And you also might be surprised to know that oxygen actually only makes up 20% of the Earth's atmosphere. The other gas is of course carbon dioxide. But before we explore that, we need to step back and learn a little about carbon itself. There is around about 1.85 billion billion tons of carbon on Earth. 99% of that is in the ground beneath our feet and in the oceans. Carbon is special because of its atomic ability to be able to connect both to itself and to other atoms. Because of this, it is the building block for many compounds and molecules, and therefore it's also the building blocks of life itself. Without carbon and without oxygen, you and I would not exist. Humanity has known for millennia that when you take a carbon-rich fuel such as wood and burn it, it releases energy, which we experience as heat. 300 years ago, a revolution occurred. Humanity invented the steam engine. By taking a carbon-rich fuel, coal, and burning it to create heat, we heated water to create steam, which powered a steam engine. This was a massive breakthrough. Before then, just about everything had been powered by water wheels, wind, horses, or people. And it set in motion a sequence of events that made contemporary life possible with trains, planes, tall buildings, and the internet. The greatest symbol of this age is the steam train, and I want to use it today as an example, but for a different purpose. As well as energy, burning carbon-rich fuels such as coal, oil and gas produces byproducts such as the smoke from this train. Over time, our understanding has improved and so has the technology. So we no longer use coal to power trains, in part because of all of the soot. But we have been less good at dealing with the byproducts of burning carbon that we can't see. When a carbon-rich fuel is burned, some of the carbon at atoms rise up into the air and they connect with some of the oxygen. In fact, one part of carbon connects with two parts of oxygen and you get CO2, also known as carbon dioxide. However, unlike soot, carbon dioxide is both odorless and transparent. And of course, what is out of sight is out of mind. The problem with CO2 is it rises up into the Earth's atmosphere where it's more insulating than the other gases. As the sun's rays enter the Earth's atmosphere, some of it is absorbed by the Earth, but the total heat also has to bounce back out into outer space. Otherwise, if you think about it, the Earth would overheat and explode. But wait, this is the problem. The carbon dioxide insulates and holds the heat in the Earth's atmosphere for longer, which is why climate change is also known as global warming. This is me in Antarctica. While I was there, I met some scientists who had this brilliant idea. They were drilling down through the Antarctic ice sheet and extracting ice cores. Every year when it snows, a little bit of air gets trapped in the, in the ice pack. And so over thousands of years, the ice sheet becomes massively thick, but it also becomes an archive of the Earth's atmosphere. By drilling down and taking these cores out, they were then able to liberate the gases and see what the atmosphere had once been. It's like time travel for climate change. Their work tells us that before the Industrial Revolution, the prevalence of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere was 0.028%. 
Now, because it's difficult to say, we often talk about carbon dioxide in parts per million. So it's 280 ppm. At the end of 2020, at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, which is one of the key places in the world for measuring atmospheric CO2, the carbon dioxide was 415 parts per million. Our use of carbon has increased the CO2 levels in the Earth's atmosphere by almost 50%. It should be no surprise to us that over the last seven years, which have had the highest levels of CO2, they've also been the warmest years in human history. There's a real tendency to see climate change as tomorrow's problem, but it's actually today's. The impacts of climate change are already being felt by coffee producers. In Ethiopia, the home of coffee, temperatures have already risen by 1.3 degrees centigrade since 1960. As well as the warmer temperatures, Coffee farmers are having to deal with longer dry seasons and shorter, more variable wet periods. Conditions that make the growing of coffee even more challenging. Scientists from London's Kew Gardens have modelled the impacts of global warming on Ethiopian coffee. It is expected that there will be a further one degree increase in temperature by the middle of the century and as much as five degrees by the end of the century. This means that coffee production under 1,500 metres above sea level will increasingly become unviable will land over 2,000 metres, will increasingly become suitable for growing coffee. Obviously, Ethiopia's 4 million smallhold coffee farmers don't have the financial resources to relocate. And this challenge highlights the stark reality of climate change, as well as an environmental challenge as a human, social and financial tragedy in the making. And as people who have a stake in the future of coffee, it's an issue that we need to do something about. In Europe, your 8-ounce milk drink a flat white, a cappuccino, a latte, has a carbon footprint of about 250 grams. Now the first thing that might surprise you is that the cup is only 5% of the total. Cups are highly visible and therefore we tend to overestimate their significance. But even under the best case scenario, it's only possible to reduce this by a percentage point or two. The other thing that might surprise you is that milk is 75% of the total. They say that there's no point crying over spilt milk, but from a carbon perspective, we should be positively weeping tears. I asked my local coffee shop, which is moderately busy, how much milk they use in a year. And from that, I was able to calculate that their carbon footprint from milk alone is 20 tonnes. Now, here's the thing about carbon. Because it's invisible, it can be quite difficult to get your head around. So what I like to do is picture big grey elephants floating in the sky. Each elephant weighs about 5,000 kilos, so this one coffee shop, just from milk, has four big grey elephants floating above it each year, just from milk. Now, think that there's 400 plus specialty coffee shops in London, and, over, and there are thousands in the UK, and there are tens of thousands of coffee shops across Europe and the US, and now picture the hundreds of thousands of grey floating elephants in the sky above all of these coffee shops just from our coffee drinking habit. This is definitely an issue that we've got to do something about. Let's start to break this problem down so we can do something about it. Globally, dairy milk has a CO2e of three kilograms. Now this is the perfect moment for me to explain carbon dioxide equivalents. There are many different greenhouse gases and they all have a different impact. So methane, for example, what cows burp, is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide over 100 years. So one kilogram of methane has a CO2e of 25 kilograms. Anyways, dairy milk in Europe has a CO2e of 1.6 kilograms, and oat milk globally has a CO2e of one kilogram. But oatly, because they're unfounded with an environmental ethos and because their manufacturing is so efficient, has a CO2e per kilogram for their barista edition of just 0.44 kilograms. This is why now, when I'm out, I order an oat milk flat white, and we've mainly used oatly at home instead of dairy milk. Changing the milks that we use can have a massive difference. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm some low carbon monk, and nor do I want you to think that oatly somehow managed to buy my soul. The truth of the matter is, is that this has been a bit of a journey for me. I used to consume a lot of dairy, but now when I'm out and I order a flat white, I order an Oatly flat white. And we mainly use Oatly at home instead of dairy milk. But I still really like farmhouse cheeses and every summer I pretty much consume my body weight in gelato. But here's another thing. 
I mainly drink filter coffee and espresso, so let's focus in on that. We're now narrowing in on the 20% of a cup of coffee's carbon footprint that comes directly from the coffee. Here's three studies that have calculated the CO2e from crop to cup. And what I've done is presented the percentage of emissions at each stage along the supply chain. Now, there's some variation between the studies as they measured coffee grown in different conditions with different processing methods and using different logistics. But the headline takeaway is this. The big red section is coffee making. The final step of turning roasted coffee beans into coffee or espresso, and that's over 50% of coffee's carbon footprint. To backtrack a little, coffee growing, its production and export is a relatively small amount, let's say about one third, and it's significantly lower if the farm uses organic fertilizers such as in the top study. The other two studies use coffee growing using petrochemical fertilizers. Since roasting uses electricity or gas and it's really hot, I thought it'd be a really significant part of coffee's carbon footprint, so I was surprised to find out that it's actually quite small. In fact, the transport of coffee from the roastery to its point of consumption is often more significant. I think it's really important to note that it is us coffee drinkers, not farmers, that are responsible for the majority of coffee's carbon footprint. However, and as is so often the way with these things, it's farmers that are first having to deal with the consequences of climate change. So, I think it would be inappropriate for us to turn up to Origin and ask them to lower their part of coffee's carbon footprint especially when we're already asking so much of them in terms of quality and price. First of all, we need to get our house in order, and we've got plenty of work to do. Espresso machines have been designed to produce a very small amount of water at near boiling temperatures, but at a precise temperature. Now, they're very good at doing that, but terrible at pretty much everything else. On a cold winter's day, I typically walk straight into the coffee shop and warm my hands on the espresso machine. It's so hot, because it's so poorly insulated and leaks so much heat. Or think about the tea spout. Cold water is brought into the espresso machine where it's heated to over 100 degrees C in the steam boiler. Then it's mixed with cold water again before it exits the tea spout at about 90 degrees. It's incredibly inefficient. Or think how often we use espresso machines badly. Often water is drawn off to polish cutlery or to clean the windows. We've also spent a lot of time teaching baristas to thoroughly purge between shots. This is hot water that we're literally flushing down the drain. Espresso machines are the most inefficient appliance in a coffee shop. In fact, even a lightly used espresso machine uses more electricity each year than an average UK household. So here's four things that we can do. First of all, we need to start thinking about espresso machines as being incredibly inefficient and only using them for making espresso. Second of all, if the espresso machine is on, let's sell lots of coffee. The, coffee per, um, the carbon footprint per coffee is much higher if we only make several dozen coffees a day compared to say 500. Thirdly, I'm really hoping that someone with more barista skills than I is going to work out what the minimal purge is between shots in order to be able to clean the group head. If we could save the amount of water used by 10, 20 or even 30%, it would make a massive difference. And finally, there's a new generation of espresso machines coming to market. They have smaller boilers, better insulation and new technologies and they're more energy efficient. So when it's time to upgrade your machine, upgrade to one of these. But also, make sure you ask your favourite espresso machine manufacturer to develop a new espresso machine that is more energy efficient, uses less electricity, and prevents global warming. If we ask them, they'll make it for us. I hope that you now might feel energised to be able to tackle your coffee's carbon footprint. But before you go, let me leave you with two thoughts. First of all, I was really surprised when I started looking at my coffee's carbon footprint, just how much difference I could make. Making these changes has actually given me the momentum and the confidence to be able to look at other areas of my carbon footprint. Second of all, it's made it really clear to me just how little I know and how much I still have to learn. There's so much to be done. And I really hope that the coffee community will come together and use their skills, their knowledge, and their talents to be able to tackle this challenge. There's so much to be done, but by sharing information, sharing knowledge, and creating best practice, we might be able to make a big difference on this issue. And this leads me to my second point. There's been many times when I've been reading a scientific paper and I think, that can't be right. 
But when I've done further reading, I've discovered that it's in fact my existing ideas that are not particularly useful for either understanding or tackling climate change. As you think about your carbon footprint, can I encourage you to do this? Use good information and good data. There's a tendency to approach problems using the tools that we already have, but sometimes it's more effective to actually just have a good look at the problem and think about how you might best tackle it afresh. What helps me is to think about both what's easy and significant. To help me do that, I've created this chart. The dots that are higher up have more benefit, and the dots that are farther to the right are easier to do. So we can go even further and divide them into four different groups. There are things that are important and are pretty easy, so we should definitely focus on these things first. There are other things that are trickier, but actually have a really significant benefit. So we should start those things now so that we can get them done across this decade. There's another group of things which have not much benefit, but are actually easy to do. So let's just do those and get those done. And finally, there's another group of things that are, have a smaller benefit and are tricky. Let's put these off for now, and let's tackle them in the future when we need to have further marginal gains. Tackling my coffee's carbon footprint in this way has been really useful for me, and I hope that it might be useful for you too. Can I encourage you to find an aspect where you can lower your coffee's carbon footprint and apply yourself to it? If we all do this, we can make a really substantial difference. But can I leave you with this thought? If we were to swap out dairy milk for Oatly, and we were to find a way to be able to reduce the amount of electricity that an espresso machine uses, then we would be able to reduce a cup of coffee's carbon footprint from 250 grams to less than 50. Together, I reckon we can do this. Tim, thank you so much. There were so many great things in that presentation. And so many things that were new to me as well, which I found really interesting. I just want to retouch on a couple of points just to make sure that I have them right in my mind and so that the people at home can take them away with them as well. Um, the first is that by changing from dairy to oatly, you can massively reduce the climate impact of your cup. Yeah, I mean, I was really surprised when I first read it and looked into this that I actually read a number of different studies. And I think it's one of the, just the great changes that we can make really, really easily. Um, and it's one of the changes that um, it's taken me a little bit of time to make. I think I came a little bit late to the party, but um, I've got there. And, um, you know, by doing that, I've been able to save um, well over 100 grams of carbon per flat white. So I think it's a, it's a really significant and worthwhile change that, that we should do straight away. You're from New Zealand, yes. aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> One thing that I know about New Zealand is that milk, dairy milk, is a huge part of everyday life and a huge part of the, the national identity. Um, how does it feel for you to have gone through a change where, where you're moving away from, from dairy? Um, that's a really good question. I think, you know, like, obviously, dairy was actually a really key part of our childhood. Like, we had milk delivered to the door in glass bottles and, you know, I grew up having cereal with lots of milk and there's dairy in everything. And um, I, think, I think the biggest change for me was actually... Um, the backdrop is that there's an idea that it's actually a really good part of life and it's actually um, a good part of your diet. And so actually being confronted with the information about the climate impact, you have to reevaluate that in a slightly different um, light. And that's taken me a little bit of time. But I think once I jumped that hurdle, it's, um, it's been easy enough to make the transition because there's really great alternatives out there. And in fact, um, after running, um, I normally come in and have a glass of water and also I've kind of just taken to um, downing a glass of, um, of Barista Edition milk because I, I, I really like the taste of it. Amazing. That's so great to hear. Um, the second thing that, that I really wanted to touch on as well is the espresso machine part of, of what you were talking about. And I think it's quite a complicated subject. With changing to oat milk, you, you can do that tomorrow. You can do that with the next coffee you buy, the next coffee you drink. Whereas with espresso machines, there's so many different layers within that. Yeah, absolutely. I think the way I would maybe look at it is to break all of the different components down into different things. So there's going to be some behavioral changes that we need to make, and there's some operational changes, and there's also just going to be some technological changes that need to be made. So to start with the behavioral ones, those are the things that we can do now. And that's why I really wanted to talk about purging and maybe some of the differences that we can make in coffee shops right now. 
One of the things when you buy an espresso machine is obviously you hold it for a number of years. And I think, you know, we know from United Bristers and from the data that coffee shops are actually upgrading sort of about every three, four, five, six years. And that maybe makes sense because there's actually not enough information out there to know whether um, carbon break even is yet on an espresso machine. But it doesn't make sense to upgrade too soon. Yeah. So I think if I could kind of encourage people, if you've got an espresso machine and it works, don't actually just change it right now, but um, do so when the time is right for your business. And if you do want to upgrade right now, then maybe I can make a little plug for United Bristers. We have a market that's very busy with people buying and selling coffee equipment, and um, it's really great. If you don't want to use it, just make sure you keep that espresso machine in use and someone else can do something in their coffee business with it. Yes, I think, I think the work that you're doing with keeping that equipment going within the coffee industry is, is really important to ensure that it is used by someone who, who will get another two, three, four, five years of use out of that machine. Yeah, it also it creates new opportunities for businesses. So, you know, like we're in a COVID time and a lot of businesses are pivoting as they have to change, you know, meet new customer demands. So, you know, some shops will want to open pop-ups or they'll want to have a second shop and some shops are closing down. So it's actually just really important that we keep all of that equipment in use as much as possible and actually it enables people to be able to seize the commercial opportunities that do exist even in this current really uncertain and quite fluid environment. Something else that you talked about is around the way that the climate is changing in Ethiopia and the impact that the climate change is having on those farmers. Do you think that we as coffee consumers have a responsibility to those farmers to change our habits to ensure that they have a continued livelihood? I mean, this is like really one of the, one of the big challenges. There's um, an incredible number of families around the world that are dependent upon coffee as their primary source of income. And most of them are actually in what you know, might be called the developing world. And um, you know, a lot of them are under financial pressure already because you know, coffee prices are really, really quite low. And on top of that, they've got a double whammy of having to deal with the, with the changes in the climate and how that puts um, stress, stress on their crops. So yes, we're going to have to do things to be able to, for the, future of, for the future of coffee and the coffee industry, it's really important that we actually cap our emissions and take responsibility for what we can. Because without um, these farmers producing coffee, like there is no coffee industry. There isn't any coffee shops. So um, I guess I've, I've come to the perspective where, where we need to take action and we need to take action now because we have years ahead of us, not, not decades to be able to resolve this problem. Tim, thank you so much. If people wanted to find out more about who you are and what you're working on, where can they head to? Yeah, um, we've actually got some more resources about uh, Coffee's Carbon Footprint on unitedbristers.com. If you just search for Coffee's Carbon Footprint, um, the right information will come up. I'd also really like to thank Barista League for hosting today's series of workshops and videos. If you want to find out more about what we're working on, you can head to sustainability.oatly.com to read our sustainability report. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.